Hi, I'm Mara Webster with In Creative Company, and I'm so excited to be sitting down with the wonderful Tracy Oliver, who is the creator, executive producer, and showrunner of the wonderful series Harlem. And in starting to talk about the show, I love the fact that you actually started writing the script for this several years ago mm -hmm. before you even did Girls Trip. And that was a time where you and a lot of your girlfriends were living through a lot of the experiences we see in the yeah. show and the themes and the topics. But at the point where you started making it, you also have that gift of being able to reflect back and really look yeah. back on those experiences. And so given that it was a journey across the path of a few years to make this, how do you feel like that really deepened and evolved the layers of the story that we've ended up seeing on screen through the show? Yeah, I was really, really fortunate because I think the person I was when I first started writing it mm -hmm. was a little more green and, <laughs> and a little more fresh-faced. Mm -hmm. And then I entered my 30s. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, these things started to, to take shape in a different way in mm -hmm. my life. And things that I thought that I would have by a certain age mm -hmm. hadn't quite worked out. Like marriage and, and kids and, and the career stuff was starting to be figured out, but I wasn't where I needed to be. And so in revisiting the script, I wanted to kind of make it that, like make it reflect where I was, which was this group of women that thought their lives were going to be at a certain place at a certain point, but then didn't quite, you know, land the way that we thought it would when we were kids. And yeah, I think that really resonates with a lot of people in their 30s, women in particular, because we were kind of sold like this idea of what we should be as women by a certain period of time. And I wanted to kind of reinforce the idea that we're not failures or we're not you know, making mistakes if, if certain things don't happen the way that we were taught they would when we were younger. I love that. And then also one of the things in your writing that you're so adept at is that ability to write these really strong and rich female ensembles. Mm -hmm. And within that, with this show, the characters have such extensive history with each other. So there's no part of them that has to hide any element of who they are or suppress themselves mm -hmm. to kind of fit into each other's space. So they're really able to be the you know, their fullest versions with each other. And yeah. I was interested in how that influences and shapes a lot of the writing and development of characters for you. I love a college group of friends. <laughs> I did that in Girls Trip as well, but I, I think why I like college so much in particular is because for me, it was a time in my life where I met all these new group of people. Like I grew up in the South. And so for the first time in college, I'm meeting people from New York. I'm meeting people from like overseas. And so you just kind of assemble like, a lot of interesting, diverse people all in one space. But that history that you have in that time of your life, like it's a lot of first, you know, it's like my first real relationship, my first like real job coming out of it. All of these firsts come out of that period of life more so than high school, I think. And those tend to be the people that are at your weddings and are at your like baby showers. And so to me, I always feel like college is a great like backstory or foundation, because like you said, there's a built in trust in history and sometimes a lot of history, you know, and, and the, these women have known each other for 10 plus years. So there's like a deep well of stuff that I can dig into and there's loyalty there. And and I think you don't have to apologize for being curt and being honest. You can kind of keep it real because I kind of view friends that are that close as kind of like family. And with my family, I we just we rip each other apart and it's all love. But I would not talk to a stranger the, the way that I talk to my sister, for example. But she knows I love her. So any harshness or anything that any truth that she doesn't want to hear, it comes with love. And the same thing with my really close friends. And when you're structuring out episodes or a season narratively, how does the dynamic of the group influence each individual arc? Because obviously you don't want all four of them to be in a place of success and everything's right. going great at the same time, but you maybe want, okay, this character over here is succeeding in, mm -hmm. in some of their goals and some of their life right now, which means that this person probably has to have things fall apart or hit some roadblocks. Yeah. And so how does that shape, not just what you want the individual arcs to be, but how you're thinking about it in relation to one another? Yeah, I think for a group of friends to feel diverse and, and to feel like we're trying to capture as much of people's real lives as possible, you kind of have to vary it. And that's real. You know, sometimes at your highest point, your friends at their lowest point, and you don't necessarily feel comfortable bragging or sharing a lot of your wins and your victories because maybe they're not doing well or vice versa. And also, you know, I have feelings about <laughs> sex and, and dating and my friends totally disagree. 
And so you just get different perspectives. And I think that's what's really important with these women was that I wanted everyone to kind of come in with different perspectives on relationships, also different places where they are in their lives. Like some might be single, some may be not some, you know, and then with with Ty in particular, you know, she's a different sexuality than everybody else. Um, and then with uh, Grace, who plays Quinn, she's figuring it out. And I had friends who I knew in college who only dated men. And then at a certain point, they started dating women. And we, those are the evolutions and the natural changes that take place over time. So all of that stuff, I just kind of wanted to put in there because I think not everybody is monolithic, even within a group of four black women. They're all so different. I mean, I I love what you're saying as well in terms of the different perspectives, Mm -hmm. because it also leads into when there are moments of conflict, it feels like it's, I have a different perspective and a different idea, a different answer. It doesn't ever feel like the show is, okay, how can they fall out this week? What's the argument between them? And those antagonistic elements between the group are really them showing up and calling each other out Mm -hmm. and being very honest and truthful with one another. And so... How do you work to create those those moments of antagonism and and always make sure that it, it never is kind of this infighting and, and this cat fighting that would be stereotypical at a certain point in writing, but really isn't in the show? Well, thank you for even noticing that. That was a deliberate thing on my part. I remember, I, I would say it's like maybe seven years ago, but there was just a lot of women fighting women on screen whether it was like scripted, I kept seeing, you know, women sleeping with, with each other's husbands or boyfriends or just throwing drinks in each other's faces <laughs> and all kinds of just cat fighting. And I was like, I kind of want to go against that because I've never crossed a line as far as my friends and like their their boyfriends or their husbands or anything like that. And I don't go around throwing drinks in people's faces. And so I was like, there's a different narrative where women love each other. And that can be harsh love. You know, you can tell the truth and hurt someone's feelings, but it's never rooted in something malicious or mean spirited. And it's all love. Like really when they hurt each other, it's because they're saying the hard thing that no one else is willing to say, or they're being vulnerable and truthful. And sometimes we're not ready to receive that, but it's all rooted in in sisterhood and love. And that was important for me. Like they, they really are rooting for each other. You know, there's no competitive, weird energy between any of them. I also, in this season, I I love the way you so beautifully explored Quinn's relationship in terms of mental health and Mm. even having her mother very present for that and her her mom show up, even though they have such a complex history with one another. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I was really interested in in how you found how you wanted to approach that because it's, it's written in a way that's so specific to her journey and her as a character. It never feels like it's because of the breakup, even though it happens after the breakup, it's her just reassessing her life and really doing a lot of internal Mm -hmm. self-discovery. And so how did you find the way in which you ultimately ended up exploring that? Wow. Well, I'm I'm so impressed with your questions because honestly, it was not about the breakup. That was just one more thing in a line of things that (laughs) were just kind of upsetting. But um, where that came was just kind of where I was at that point in the writer's room and where a lot of us were as writers. We did the first season pre-pandemic, and by the time the second writer's room had started, this was a Zoom room, and I'd never done that before. And in comedy, it's just awful to just be pitching jokes, and then your screen freezes, and then nobody laughs, and then you're like, let me try it again. Actually, I don't want to because that's weird. And you're just, it just brought down the mood, and we knew people who were dying, and we knew people that you know we're we're just not doing well in the pandemic and it just didn't feel like authentic and genuine for everybody to be in this happy place when i knew we weren't and, and we also knew the world wasn't so it just felt like why don't we channel some of the depression and some of the anxiety we're feeling into quinn and quinn was the the character that i wanted to explore because she was always the most upbeat and optimistic and in the first season, the strongest one, you know, the one that everyone assumed didn't have problems. So for her to be the one to be like, I'm really having a tough go at it meant something because I wanted to show that even your most like optimistic, happy go lucky people aren't always that way. And they have, you know, issues too. And so, you know, for Quinn to reach that point meant something to me. And then for the mom, I thought it was a chance of like maybe redemption with their relationship because 
uh, Quinn has a really tough mom. <laughs> and I was like, it would be great to see her kind of step up and be there for her versus being absent or being emotionally unavailable, which I think she is most of the time. But in this moment, I wanted to kind of bring them together on some level. It, it's also such a great example of the way that you write very specifically. So that arc is, is so specifically Quinn, but it's so universal and relatable. And um, I know when you were working on Girls Trip, Will Packer, who was one of the producers, kind of kind of gave you that note of be as specific as you want to be, mm -hmm. because that's actually what's going to draw people in. That's what's going to connect them rather than trying to write in broader terms. Yeah. And so when he kind of said that to you all those years ago, how do you feel like that's really shifted the way that you think about writing things like Quinn's storyline, where you can be so specific mm -hmm. to character, but it really taps in and connects to audiences in such specific ways as well? I think what Will Packer said was maybe the most perfectly like worded and helpful advice I think for a writer because sometimes especially for someone like me because I do commercial stuff I do unapologetically silly commercial stuff I'm not a niche like indie writer and so one of the challenges that comes with that is you're trying to reach the most amount of people like how do you write in a way that if you, you want to fill up like you know an entire movie theaters or you want to like have you know, box office like numbers and whatever. If you want to hit like just really high numbers, you kind of have to think like, well, it can't be too niche. And so with the women in Harlem, I was like, I still want to be able to be specific and I want to be niche, but I want it to like resonate with a lot of people. And so what you kind of have to do if I'm taking Will Packer's advice and, and I hope it works, but what I was trying to do was make sure that we're authentic and truly hitting this character story. And hopefully it'll resonate with a lot of people, but you can't kind of go into it thinking, I'm gonna write this broadly enough where it hits everything. You just kind of have to be really specific and truthful. And then what I found um, with the response from Quentin's character in the depression storyline, it really resonated. A lot of people were messaging me privately to say, wow, I felt seen and heard. I'm just not doing well. And I'm so glad that you guys actually put that in a comedy. Because, um, you know, d depression is not the most funny and light material, but I felt like we needed to do it. And that specificity did speak to people. I love that. And, and, and lastly, you know, obviously any trajectory into the entertainment industry, what's so fascinating about it is I've never met two people who've had the same pathway. Right. And there's so many different directions that you end up heading that often feel like they're not in the right place. But but there's something I've heard you talk about in terms of even how you felt like when you were working in the service industry and and working as wait staff at mm -hmm. restaurants, that you feel like that gave you skill sets which were valuable because yeah. it's all about working under pressure. You're observing people, you're interacting, you're seeing how they are, you know, when they don't think anyone's looking at them and paying attention to the dynamics. Mm -hmm. um, and I was just interested in, you know, now that you're at this stage in your career, how you found little inflections like that and things that didn't feel like they were valuable contributions towards the career path you were trying to build for yourself, but in reflection have become little moments and little skill sets that you picked up along the way. Oh, that's an amazing question. I think for me, I never knew growing, growing, sorry, I'll start that over. <laughs> for me, I never knew growing up that all of this stuff was gonna matter one day. I even thought being from the South was a disadvantage because I, didn't, I knew no one in entertainment. And so for me, I couldn't even figure out a path to get here because I was like, I don't have an aunt or uncle who works at a studio or works in entertainment. I had no, and I didn't even have one relative on the West Coast period. So I was like, I can't even go crash at somebody's like house and stay on the couch. How do you figure this out? But what I've, what I've found about growing up in the South or working all of these terrible jobs, I was a hostess, I worked in retail, I worked at The Gap in particular. I have so many stories about The Gap. Um, I just, and I did a lot of different jobs. And I think what that actually did for me was it made me able to relate to regular people. And I, the reason why that's important is because I do feel like sometimes people live in a bubble and you only know your immediate circle. And that's what you write. You write only what you know, but when you grow up with regular people <laughs> and you don't grow up rich and you don't have a lot of connections, you're just a lot more in tune with what the masses think about because you are one of them and you grew up like that and you didn't grow up in this very isolated bubble. And then also you know how to speak to bad jobs. You know how to write in a way that people can relate to 
because they feel like you've lived it. And one of the things that I've gotten about my characters is that they're really relatable. And I think that it's not an accident that I, all of these <laughs> experiences like added up to that because I live them. I like, I know what it means to be broke. Like I know what it means to, you know, get your heart broken and, you know, to not have like the connections that you need that match the ambitions that you have and how hopeless that feels. And that's, you know, what I use to, to write Angie's character. Like there's just a lot of different things that I kind of fuse into my work that I grew up with, but I think it's an asset now. So I hope that people <laughs> who are like me, who may feel hopeless about not being as well connected or not coming from money or any of that stuff can draw inspiration from this because we have a lot of stories and we have a lot of insights and there's a, there's a huge advantage if you can tap into it. Absolutely. I mean, I, I love the second season. It's such a, a phenomenal series in terms of building on everything that you built as a foundation in season one. So congratulations on that. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. I really appreciate it. 